Boise, we're so glad you're here this morning. Would you stand and worship with us? Can light it up, you can light it up. 
stronghold will crumble. I hear the chains in the ground. Oh God of revival, pour it out, pour it out. Atmosphere is changing now. The spirit of the Lord is here. The evidence is all around. The spirit of the Lord is here. The atmosphere is changing. Come, 
just want to pray over this congregation as we start this next song. God, I don't, I couldn't name a single person in here that probably doesn't have their stuff, doesn't have something going on in their life that they need you. In this room, there are struggles, there are hurts, there is shame, there is pain, there is brokenness, there is exhaustion. And God, most of the people in this room can attest to the times that you've come to their aid before. And so, God, I pray with this next song that uh, as we worship you, you would just remind them that you are still here for them. And if there's someone in the room who can't really say that, if there's someone who's maybe wondering, like, is he really there? Are you really there, God? I pray that you would make it clear to them who you are. God, make it clear to them that you're here to do it again. Walking around these walls I thought by now they'd fall 
But you have never failed me yet. Waiting for change to come Knowing the battle's won For you have never failed me yet It's Jesus Your promise still stands Great is your faithfulness Your faithfulness I'm still in your hands This is my confidence You've never failed me Never fail me yet. I know the night won't last Your word will come to pass My heart will sing your praises You've 
I'm so thankful that we serve a faithful God. Uh, he is the same yesterday, today, and forever, that his promises he made thousands of years ago still stand today. Um, so in that atmosphere of worship, uh, we're going to invite our prayer team up here in just a second. Uh, and I want to encourage you this morning, um, as we were just singing that God is faithful. One thing that I love is that when we call on the name of God, um, there is no prayer that is too small or too big for God. And what I mean by that is there's nothing that's too small where we may say, you know, it's not really that big a deal. Um, I don't know if God is really going to care about this thing going on in my life. And we may say that to ourselves, but man, God cares because the Bible says that God knows your name. He knows the number of hairs on your head. He knows the, the smallest things going on in your life. And if there's something going on in your life that you would say, you know what? I don't know if it's big enough for me to go to God about. I would encourage you this morning, take that step of faith and say, God, this may seem in, in, insignificant in the grand scheme of all things, but it's important to me. And so God, I wanna to come to you with that. And in the same token, there is nothing that is too big for God. Like what is the thing in your life that only God could make happen? What is the thing that you would say, I need a miracle to take place in my life because I can't do this by myself. I need a big God to make a big move in my life. And so I encourage you this morning, whether, no matter where you're at in that, come find someone to come pray with you. Because when we pray, God moves and incredible things happen. So I'm gonna pray, we're gonna invite our, our uh, prayer team forward. Uh, and we encourage you, come, come up front and allow God to do something in your life. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your faithfulness. Lord, that when we call on your name, Lord, that you respond that we aren't praying to a dead God. We aren't praying to an empty God, but we are praying to the living and holy God. Lord, we pray that we would see the miraculous take place this morning. Lord, in those small things that may not seem like that big a deal, Lord, that you would prove that you care for us and that you know us. And Lord, for those big things that only you can do, we pray that you would move mountains on our behalf. And so God, we invite you in this morning and we ask that you would meet us here. Praise in Jesus' name. We encourage you to come up front, find someone to pray with. Jesus, Jesus, 
Church, he is the King of Kings. Your name is a lie that the shadows can't deny. Your name cannot be overcome. Your name is a lie forever lifted high. Your name cannot be overcome. God, we thank you, Lord, that we can come before you as your people, as your church, as your body, Lord. We thank you that you're with us, that you walk amongst us, and that you breathe your breath into us, Lord. Father God, we ask that you be honored and glorified in this service. Lord God, these things we pray in your name. Amen. Good morning. You can be seated. I want to tell you something that's really awesome that's happening at our church. So on Wednesday nights, we meet here, it's family night, and in January, we started a new study um, using an app on your phone, and if you don't have a phone or don't have a smartphone, we print it out on paper. So everybody can participate, and we have tables set up, and it's called the Bible Engagement app, and we have started doing that. And the first couple weeks, um, we, we had you know, a lot of people coming, and then guess what happened? It snowed. Right? Everybody remember all that snow that was on the ground? Nobody could get out of their driveways, right? So then we didn't have as many people, right? But this last week on Wednesday, we filled up every table that we had set up. They were packed full. And so guess what we're going to do next week? This week, this Wednesday, we are putting out more tables. I know. Woo! 
Yes, so excited. And I'm so thankful because of your giving that we are able to purchase new tables, right? That will be lighter, easier to move. I know, big, huge, praise the Lord, right? Because everybody knows how hard those heavy wood tables are to move, right? So thank you all for your giving and for your faithfulness. Thank you for coming and participating. I encourage you to come on Wednesday nights. Come and build relationships with people here because we are building relationships that are more intimate and more deep and deeper than you can with a handshake on a Sunday morning. So I encourage you, come. Come on Wednesday nights. I'm going to call our ushers forward, and then we'll go ahead and take our offering. Father God, just thank you, Lord. Thank you for your people. Thank you, Lord, for your abundance that you pour out through your people. Father God, I ask that you would touch every life here, every home represented, Father, that you would provide for every need, every emotional need, every spiritual need, every mental need, Lord, and every physical need. Father God, because you are the God of provision, you are the God of abundance. Lord God, we just thank you, and we give back, Lord. We give back to you what you have given us. Lord, and we ask, Father, that you would give us wisdom and guidance and direction, Lord, of how we can best use your provision to impact your kingdom, Lord, and to claim and grow our community for you. Father, all these things we pray in your mighty name. Amen. Amen, amen. All sorts of awesome stuff going on. Man, it is a beautiful day to be at church, isn't it? Amen. So uh, we're going to do something a little different today, and we're going to play with stuffed animals. It's a joke. I'm going to invite the uh, Forey family up here. We get to do an awesome thing. We get to participate, love in the family, change in the world by dedicating baby Samuel to the Lord. So everyone that is here, part of the Forey family, make your way up here. Make your way up here. Come on, give him a big hand. Pastor Chase isn't shy. I guess the rest of them just got to wait a little bit. Come on up. Come on up. Extended family, cousins, aunts, uncles, second, third, fourth cousins. What a beautiful family. So glad to have them as part of our church. Awesome, awesome, awesome. 
get to dedicate a baby to the Lord. Yeah. Making their way up here. Do you think he's going to let me hold him, Hannah? All right. Come here, dude. Come here. Let's see. Oh, yeah. What's up? I hold him all the time during the week, so we'll see how long this goes. Can you say hi? Not yet. Okay. <laughs> Not there yet. Hey, so this morning we get this special honor. This is an awesome thing you get to do at church and dedicate a baby to the Lord. Pastor Chase and Hannah's little guy. This is Samuel Forey. Can you say hi? No, just want the microphone. It's cool. We'll just keep talking. What a privilege. This is, we are participating in what the Bible tells us to do. Proverbs 22, 6. Start children off on the way they should go. Even when they are old, they will not turn from it. We don't see in the Bible anywhere where it tells us to baptize children. Uh, we wait until the child's old enough to understand salvation before we do that. But the Bible does place a high priority on kids. That's why you hear us say, love the family, change the world. Uh, we can't control everything that our kids will face. Man, I wish we could, but we can't. But what we can do is follow the example that's set forth in Scripture for us, which is dedicate kids to the Lord. We see in God's Word uh, where children are dedicated to God. Ironically, 1 Samuel chapter 1, Hannah presents her son Samuel to the Lord. So way to go. Follow the Bible. Exactly. Way to go. <laughs> So we're pretty much copying it. Jesus' parents brought him to the temple in Luke 2 to present him to the Lord. You see three different gospels that children and babies were brought to Jesus so he could lay hands on them. Matthew 19, 14, Jesus says, Let the little children come to me. Do not hinder them, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. That's why we say if we love the family, we can change the world. This one is special to me because it's not often you get to see the whole entire journey uh, like I have with uh, Pastor Chase and Hannah. I was there when they were first getting to know each other. I remember vividly I was on vacation. Chase called me and he said, Hannah wants to get coffee. What do I do? <laughs> True statement. I was honored to get to officiate their wedding. Uh, them finding out Samuel was on the way pretty much coincided with them arriving at our church. And if you haven't heard Pastor Chase talk about that, you should go find the sermon. Uh, it's just powerful. Uh, testimony of God's goodness. The name Samuel actually means something like God has heard or name of God. And in this case, it's safe to say there many prayers sent to heaven by Chase and Hannah, and God heard all of them. This little guy is the result. Today, we get to, as a church, walk in obedience together, dedicate Samuel to the Lord. Uh, doesn't give salvation or forgiveness of sins, and that's up to the child when they're old enough to understand. But Chase and Hannah today, they are acknowledging Samuel, he's a gift from God. It's their responsibility to raise him according to God's direction in his word. And as a church, as Engaged Boise, we acknowledge it's our responsibility. Yeah, help me. It's our responsibility to fulfill the role of a church family. Always be a place where truth and grace and mercy are found. So Chase and Hannah have a couple of questions for you. Uh, you can agree together by answering, we will. Chase and Hannah, do you accept your God-given responsibility to raise Samuel in a Christ-centered home? Say, we will. <laughs> Do you pledge that on your best days and your worst days, you will always point Samuel towards Jesus? We will. Church family, would you stand with us today? I have a question for you. We set a Christ-like example. Support Chase and Hannah unconditionally. Make church a place where Samuel always wants to be. If so, will you please say we will? Would you stretch your hands forward and let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you. For your presence here, thank you for this precious little guy. Thank you for the Forey family. Thank you. You knew this little guy before he was born. You knit him together in his mother's womb, and he's here before us today. Uh, we just dedicate him to you today in the presence of your people. We ask you to put a plan and a purpose on his life, plan to prosper him, not to harm him. Give him a hope and a future. Give Pastor Chase and Hannah wisdom and understanding every moment, every day. Lord, bind their family together by the power of your name. Let your blood cover them and protect them, Lord Jesus. We give little Samuel to you. We ask as a church family, this would be a safe uh, place, full of your mercy, full of your grace. We would always point him towards you on all of our days. Lord, we give this God to you. Thank you for the Forey family, for the blessing they are to us. Would you bless them today, Lord, in your name? Amen. Would you give them a big hand today? Thank you guys so much. Give you back. All those times. Oh, wait, man, I forgot to give you all the cool stuff. It's Lammy Bible certificate. I'll give those to Hannah. There we go. She won't lose those. Thank you guys for being a part of that this morning. Grab my other stuff. <clears throat> I 
It's a little more than a workout than I expected, holding it with one arm the whole time. Man, I got used to that. What a beautiful day. Thanks for coming to church, man. That's why you come. Didn't have room on the table for all the stuff. I was smart enough not to put all this out there so he couldn't get it, you know, while we were talking, so... Man, it is a beautiful morning. It's warm out there. There's a little snow on the ground, and it's in our big pile out there. The kids love to play on that. That's why the snow tools are still out there. Doesn't get any better than that, dedicating a little guy to the Lord. We love kids, and uh, we believe in them, and we try to train them up in the way they should go. And we're getting to see God wonderfully put that in motion uh, in our church. I'm so honored to be a part of it with each of you. Uh, Honored to be a part of carrying forth just this rich legacy this church has. But I believe very much that God has great things ahead of us we have not even scratched the surface yet of or even imagined. We actually get to repeat that baby dedication here in a couple weeks with Olga and Kirill's little guy, Kai. And I have a feeling we're going to get to keep doing it uh, over and over again for a little bit. So, it's awesome. Want to put, uh, Pastor Wendy kind of stole my thunder during offering. Uh, I actually have a picture, though, Pastor Wayne. Will you throw that picture up there, Sandy? I want to put a bug in your ear. You saw the announcements already. That's for Wednesday's quick picture last week. There you go, the full tables. We're going to set up two more tables than that, spread them out a little bit. Uh, I, was, I love snow, man. I love snow so much, and the Lord has heard my prayers, but he keeps bringing it on, like, Wednesdays and Saturday nights. So just kindly, Lord, not on those two days. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, it's really cool. We've got all kinds of people there. You can see in that picture, all ages, uh, people who have accepted the Lord recently, people who have known the Lord their whole lives. And the beautiful thing about the Word of God, about community, is that every age, every spiritual condition is learning. Conversations, the questions, the fellowship, agreeing together in prayer, it's all part of it. Uh, I, what I love is there's questions at those tables that I would never ask by the Scripture to read and perspective that I don't have. I haven't lived everyone else's life. If you want to grow in your faith, you're just genuinely curious about what the Bible actually says, this is the place that you want to be. So there's my commercial for it. It's been awesome, so we just encourage you, come on out on Wednesday nights. We're going to continue today in this uh, little short series called Routine Maintenance. I spent a little time setting it up last week, so I'd encourage you to go listen, at least the beginning of the message from last week, and you can kind of know where we're going. We talked about how if you drive a car, you've probably seen this little symbol on your dash at some point. We call that the check engine light. Talked about how if you drive a car, you've probably seen it. This specific one is from a Volkswagen. I've owned a couple of their awesome cars, but that stinking light is on all the time in those cars. We talked about how the most important part of routine maintenance for a vehicle is an oil change. In most cases, number one thing that will keep your vehicle running for a long time. It'll help your vehicle take you all kinds of new places. It's the best way to keep it operating the way the people who designed it meant it to operate. Our life as believers is disciples of Christ. It also takes some routine maintenance if it's going to work the way that the creator has designed it. Not routine as in boring, but routine as in what we're purposeful about because we want it to be better. We're purposeful about our relationship with Christ because we want it to be better. In our lives as believers, friends, Jesus is inviting us into more than just surviving. God's will for you, no matter how your life is, it's more than just surviving. I promise you that. Oil change for our Christian life, like we talked about last week, is just daily devotions, daily time spent with God. The Bible Engagement Project helps us to do that. Keep our personal devotions there, something that keep our spiritual check engine light from coming on. Today, we're continuing along with that theme, and we're talking about the nuts and bolts. Nuts and bolts. Even if you have a handle on your regular oil change, and you are all just wonderful people who pay attention to those sorts of important things, so I'm sure you're the people who just pull in 3,001 miles. You're ready to pull into the place, get that thing checked, right? Yeah, not so much, Stacey says. Uh, There's nuts and bolts, though, that are often needing to be fixed on whatever vehicle you drive. Thinking specifically of the types of things that you don't have to technically do in order to drive the vehicle. But, man, they sure are nice. But a lot of times they're really small. I've never had a brand new vehicle. For reference, uh, for our vehicles now, we have a 2008 Toyota Prius and a 2014 Yukon. uh, Neither of which was new when we got them. Uh, 
The Prius is probably 10 years old. Yukon is about five. They're great vehicles. We're so blessed. The, the best thing about our cars is I don't have to work on them that often. Praise the Lord. And I spoke that into existence, and now I'm going to have to work on them. That's usually the way that it works. Not here to argue about car buying strategies, but I have heard it said from people who can and do buy brand new cars. By the way, more power to you, man. If you can buy a brand new car, absolutely go for it. But they say something like, I just want to have a vehicle that has nothing broken. I want everything to work. Some folks are able to kind of do this deal where they trade it in every year or two, thereby avoiding any type of upkeep or fixing. Because isn't that so true? Very few exceptions if you drive a car. Even nice cars have little nuts and bolts that break for one reason or another. We mentioned last week the average car has about 30,000 parts. That's if you include every piece, every fastener, 30,000 parts. And with that many parts, it stands the reason that stuff's going to break. I've seen the way some of you drive. Stuff's going to break on your car. I'm just saying. <laughs> Not necessarily things you have to have in order to get from point A to point B, but man, they sure are nice. They sure do make it a lot more pleasant. In many cases, if you get these things done, you take care of them, you can be more efficient during your day. In short, they just enhance the quality of your life. You fix the nuts and bolts. A lot of you, hopefully, you're thinking of the things in your vehicle that just make it so much nicer. An example in your mind, for a lot of you, it's the radio. If there's no music in the car, you might as well not even get in there, right? It just, it's a useless hunk of metal if there's no music in the car. Some of you have these things in your car called seat heaters. It sounds like a, just a thing you don't really need until you have them, and then you don't have them, then you realize how much you need them. <laughs> it's really nice. Maybe some of you in this place even have self-driving cars. I'm not sure how you go about even fixing those, but awesome if you have it. Just be careful, please. No sleeping at the wheel. Got so many examples to cite that I'll reference kind of as we go along this morning, but I have just one to help us narrow our focus. What really got me thinking about this was a while ago, something on our Yukon from a couple months ago. It's the nicest car we've ever had, and it is nice. It's awesome. Got it from my parents who are here today. They take really good care of their vehicles. They sold it to us. It was in great shape. I've had some version of these vehicles, these like Chevy or GMC trucks for a long time. I've had a 93, I've had a 97, an 03, and now I have a 14. It's really funny about vehicles how there's certain noises the 93 made that the 2014 makes. They sound the same for some reason. Now, after a little while of having this one we have now, I started hearing this clonking underneath one of the wheels. That's how you know someone doesn't know very much about cars when they use words like clonk. <laughs> they describe it that way. What's it doing? Well, it goes clonk. Makes sense? But I'd hear the clonk when I went over a bump, just not all the time. I'd hear the clonk. And I kind of figured, I like, tried to work on cars a little bit. I can YouTube stuff, you know. I, I figured it was a shock or a strut. The thing about shocks and struts, some of you might know, is they're expensive. About $1,750 or so to get your shocks or struts done. Nice to have, but not something you have to do to drive. So I did what a lot of you would do, and I just kept driving it. Would have been nice to fix, but not $1,700 nice. <laughs> So I drove around with it, generally kind of being annoyed, but not willing to go much further than that. Until one day, not too long ago, I had to get new tires. And the guy at the tire shop told me that I had a th broken sway bar link. I thought what most of you are thinking is, that sounds expensive. Sway bar link. So I asked the guy, Al had sent me to this tire shop, he knows, Celeste Schwab. The guy was really kind, and I said, hey, how much is that? Is it something I can fix myself? Is it expensive? He said, it's not expensive, but you probably could do the repair yourself. So after a little Googling, YouTubing, I decided to take it on. The guy was right. The part I ended up getting, about 20 bucks. Sure enough, I was able to do it myself with a little help from Pastor Chase because I stink at cars. Tell you what, $20 part. Changed everything about the way it drives. In fact, I have one right here. This is the one for the other side that I'll do when the other one breaks. Look at this guy. Look at this complicated piece of machinery. It's got a washer, two punks of rubber, a pole, more washers, and more rubber. 20 bucks. Changed everything about the way the thing felt. I realized once I fixed this thing that I had been subconsciously slowing down or avoiding bumps because of the noise. I didn't know if it was hurting anything. I just didn't want to hear the noise. 
Sometimes I'd even like take a different route into the neighborhood because there was less bumps because I disliked that noise so much. Didn't have to fix it. Didn't have to do this little bit of routine maintenance, but it sure changed how I felt about going over a bump. Today for us as disciples of Christ, the nuts and bolts, the things that make life so much better, one of those is simply what you were doing today. It's coming to church. Belonging to a body of believers, tell you what, it makes the bumps much less painful. Here's why I make the connection today. Uh, This morning, uh, this is something as a pastor you always hear being talked about. The reason is because something we often hear as pastors, people who work at churches, help church happen, you hear people say this thing, which is you don't have to go to church to be a Christian. You know what? It's technically true. Don't like it. It's technically true. You don't have to darken the church at the door of a church to go to heaven. But if you can find one that's good, and we believe we have one here, then life is so much better. The ride is much more enjoyable. The bumps are infinitely less painful. There are often just a couple small things about the right body of believers to do life with that they can make all the difference for you. So while we're talking about routine Maintenance, we're going to talk about going to church, why it's important, what God does here. Why does this one thing change how we feel about our walk with Christ? How we can help us become more of a disciple each day, become disciples and make disciples. I want to say something really quick, though. My intention is in no way to judge you, shame you for how much you have or have not been to church. I, I'm not keeping attendance. There's no check boxes or anything like that for me. My intention is just to understand how awesome the local church is, how much better it is if you're a part of it. That's what I'm hoping to do today. So as we talk about the routine maintenance of going to church, a couple things to remember. One of them is this. We are commanded to not give up on the house of God. We're going to read a scripture here in a moment that's really near and dear to me, near and dear to most pastors, I would imagine. It's not me being legalistic, telling you that a certain amount of times missing during the year puts you over the line. And now you can't go to heaven. Oh, man, you missed four times, and then you got sick and missed a fifth. You're out until next year starts over. Better be good. Not a passage that I know of that spells it out just like that. But there is one that tells us not to give up on coming together. Let's read together this morning, uh, Hebrews 10, 24, and 25. This is out of the NIV this morning. Author of Hebrews says this, And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. We're going to dig into some specific reasons why I believe this is written down. But look at what the author of Hebrews writes in 24. I keep saying the author because we don't know who wrote it. But look at what they say in verse 24. Let us consider... It's on the screen there you have in your Bibles. Let us consider. If you zoom out a little bit, this entire section of Hebrews 10, it's about persevering in our faith. That's what comes before this part we just read. And after it is about how serious an offense it is if we say we've repented, but we fully intend to keep on sinning and we never meant it. That's what comes after. And sandwiched right in the middle, the author of Hebrews, he says, or she says, I don't know, the author of Hebrews says, Let us consider something. Put another way, the author could be saying, let's just stop and think about this for a moment. Between those two things, persevering and repentance, let's talk about going to church. Between persevering and repentance, let's talk about not giving up on meeting together. I think we can tell from what comes after, let us consider in verse 24, that the early believers, you know what? They were struggling with the same things that we struggle with. Those things are, how do we love as Jesus loved, live as Jesus lived? How do we become a disciple in the times in which we find ourselves? The more importantly, person who wrote Hebrews, why should I keep going to church if someone there is bugging me? Why should I keep going if someone there annoys me? Those that are laughing have been there before. Thank you for being honest. I appreciate it. (laughs) The author is asking this really important question that encompasses church, and that is, how do we spur one another on toward love and kindness each day? 
That's the important thing that's being asked. And if verse 24 holds the question, then verse 25 holds the answer. It's really simple. Verse 25 says, we do not give up on the habit of meeting together. Now, meeting together, it might have looked different in ancient times, probably more houses and less buildings like this. But there's no getting around the fact that the author is speaking of their version of a church service. He's saying, author is saying, instead of giving up on going to church or having church, the instruction is that they're supposed to do something else instead. Don't give up what you were supposed to do. Let's encourage one another. Don't give up on meetings together. Instead, encourage one another. So this is the point where you sit, maybe squirm a little bit, and you're like, this, like you're putting this really well, Pastor. I really appreciate it. But I, I don't know how to tell you this. Church can be kind of hard sometimes. Don't know how to tell you that. Well, guess what? I know that church can be hard sometimes. I love the local church. It's so valuable. I believe it's the great hope of the world for people to know Jesus. I know that God's church, our church, the Big C Church and our church, they're not perfect. And they even, yes, are difficult sometimes. I even know why they're difficult sometimes. You ready for this? It's because I'm here. Also got really bad news for you. I hate to tell you this because you're here. There's a reason it's difficult. It's because we're here. The good news, though, is that that's not a new story. There's a reason this got written in Hebrews. The fact that there are messed up people in church, people who are struggling, yeah, people who annoy you, that's why the author of Hebrews had to write this in the first place. To say to them, hey, there's some people that I know you think of as knuckleheads or fill in the blank, whatever word you want to say, I know. But don't give up on it. Man, no matter how hard it is, no matter how frustrating it is, no matter how early it seems, don't give up. It's beautiful if you give it a chance. You might be thinking, whoever wrote that, whoever that person is that wrote Hebrews, listen, they have not seen some of the churches that I've seen. <laughs> and I am with you, man, I am with you. Trust me, you work in churches long enough, I got about 20 years in, you see some things that make you shake your head. <laughs> you might even think it would be easier to just go at it alone. You know what, That's, I've had enough. Put in my time. But I have a few concrete reasons for you that you should come to church. Now, you're doing it today. I'm preaching to the choir a little bit. But those of you listening on online and hear the podcast later, whatever, here's the reasons you should come to church, concrete reasons. One of those is this. Isolation magnifies problems, but it keeps us from having to solve them. Let that sink in for a second. See, what happens when we are isolated and we don't have fellowship is we start to do this thing. We start to think that there is only one correct opinion on everything when we're by ourselves, and that correct opinion happens to belong to us. No one around to disagree, my opinion must be right. And because there is no one to respectfully disagree, and these days it's doubly difficult because you can find a website, a news channel, a person on the corner to validate pretty much anything you want. You have a crazy theory, you go Google it, someone agrees with you somewhere. So what happens is if we isolate ourselves, we never have to confront our issues or the very real possibility that we might be wrong about something. And what we think is that the isolation is keeping us from causing problems for ourselves or for other people, but what it's really doing is hiding the change that might need to happen inside of us when we keep ourselves isolated. I knew it would be quiet during that part, that's okay. <laughs> Something that goes hand in hand with the idea of avoiding isolation is this. When we worship together, we bring out the best in each other. When I say worship together, I don't mean technically be in the same room, witness the same service, happen to hear the same songs. I'm talking about like what happened this morning when we worship, when God moves and we experience it together. There's something about experiencing something with someone that changes it. And one of the beautiful things about church is that we can plan it and do it to the best of our ability, but God gets to decide how he wants to move. It's up to us to experience it, but God gets to decide how he wants to move. Yeah. 
I can say from personal knowledge, man, experiencing a worship service together, the songs, the communion, the message, the baptism, and I've been in and in charge of all that stuff. It has the power to unite us if we're focused on God. All of those things, all the things we do today, they have the power to unite us if we focus on God. Yeah, you can sing songs on your own. You, some of you are talented. You can even go home and play and sing the songs on your own. But it's better when there are other people experiencing it with you. It just is. Part of worshiping together is studying God's word like we're doing on Wednesdays. You're hearing us talk about that a lot. It's because it's awesome. Reading and studying God's word together, it's another facet of meeting together that has the power to unite us. Because it's unchanging. It's the same yesterday, today, and forever. It's really beautiful on Wednesdays because there's these relationships forming and there's understanding that's happening because we are gathering together. And what you find out is how much you have in common with people you never would have said hello to in the first place when you get stuck at a table with them. Hint, that's why we set up the tables that way. (laughs) And I'd guess pretty much everybody there has heard a question or asked a question or heard an opinion given that they had never personally considered. Both of those things are happening because we're doing what seems routine, the routine maintenance of meeting together. Finally, I believe God would have us see that when we worship together, our gifts are discovered and activated. There's many of us here that are living proof of how great of a place church is to discover what you are and are not good at. Many of the things I spend my time doing, how I work, I discovered and I honed those gifts in church. You might be thinking, yeah, you know what, you're the exception because you work at a church. But I will tell you this, when I was a teenager, my parents took me to church and I found out what I knew how to do, what I liked, what I was good at, what I was not. I'm so thankful that they tried to put me in a skit when I was like 13 and I was awful at it. And I figured out this is not for me. Memorizing stuff and having to repeat it to people, no thank you. But I did find out the stuff God had gifted me at. And here's what happened, uh, you know, quite a while ago when the economy tanked and I worked at a church, but the church couldn't pay me full time. Uh, I needed to go find a job. And what I started doing, because I was awful at skits, hadn't learned to play an instrument yet, is I started running sound. So I learned everything about AV from churches. And I got better and better at it. I did more and more of it. And when that uh, time came, you know, 2010-ish, the economy was way down. I went out and I got a job at a production company. I would work 40 hours a week at this production company in Boise, go from Caldwell where our house was to Boise, out to Cuna to the church, and then back home. Put 40,000 miles on one of those Volkswagens I was talking about that year. I'll tell you what, those gifts that I started to learn and hone and bring out at church, setting up for youth group every Wednesday after basketball practice, that led me to producing, running some of the biggest events in the Valley. I am not uh, exaggerating when I say that I probably ran an event that you were at during that year or those years after that because I did them at the Idaho Center. I did them at where the Steelheads play. Uh, I did them every big place you can possibly imagine. I did political rallies, country shows, rock shows. So all you sinners that went to the secular music shows, I was at all of those. (laughs) I'll tell you what, man, you have not lived until you've been to a country show on a Friday night. They are interesting places to be. Got to talk to a lot of people about the Lord, I'll tell you that, tell you what. But I did all this stuff, I had... Honestly, all the work I could do, and then when I was full-time at the church, I would always have these side jobs. I discovered those gifts in church. I honed those gifts in church, and I was able to take them outside of this place. The first instrument I ever played or touched was in church. Church's bass player left, and they're like, hey, do you, you want to learn to play bass? And I was like, I guess. Show me how it works. Since then, I've played all kinds of venues, all kinds of places, for all kinds of reasons, but church is where I discovered and I activated those gifts. There's a bunch of people who could come up here and they could tell you a similar story. And all of those are ways that we participate in what the scripture in Hebrews says. All those are ways that we encourage each other, as verse 25 mentioned. You might be thinking, what about that elephant in the room we talked about a little bit ago, which was church can be kind of hard. 
You see, church can be hard to get to. It can be hard to find a good one. It can be hard to handle it when the people that I like don't go there anymore. It can be hard to handle it when people are critical of me. It can be hard to find music you like. It can be hard to find coffee you like. It can be hard to find chairs that are comfortable. Well, we can make the list real long, and you could keep adding stuff to it, right? But let me relate it to the routine maintenance we've been talking about when it comes to cars. I told you I've had a couple of Volkswagens. One was the Jetta I drove during that year, uh, worked at the production company, eventually got rear-ended and wrecked. But we had another one. It was a Volkswagen Passat. I think it was a 2000. Like I said, I love these cars. They're just they're fun to drive. They're cool. It had a turbo in it. The turbo was kind of old and loud, so it sounded like a jet engine. It was awesome. And I loved this car, but it had the weirdest issue. It always started. It always ran. But it had random lights that would come on. Sometimes the alarm would go off in the middle of the night. The check engine light would come on for no reason. The seller told me about this. They, they told me all about it, and they said, listen, there's just one weird thing that does some weird electronic things. I'm like, oh, okay. I can Google that, YouTube that, no problem. It always started, but you never knew what fun thing was going to happen. You couldn't lock it because you went to lock it, and it would just automatically unlock itself. I don't know why. Well, actually, eventually I did figure out why. But it always started. It always ran. I really wanted to fix this car because I love this car. I searched and I searched and I Googled and I YouTubed and I asked every Volkswagen person I could find. For a couple years, I asked and I Googled. And I tried simple, small fixes, sprain, contact cleaner, and tightening stuff. It just never seemed to help. Never seemed to help. And then every once in a while, you'd get in, start the car, and it would be, bing, the trunk's open, and the trunk is not open. Until one day, I stumbled across this webpage, and the webpage said, stupid $90 door switch fixed my VW. I thought, that sounds awesome, right? So I clicked on it, and this person is describing how they bought this switch that goes in their driver's door, and it fixed everything. I've been hunting for years by now, so I'm like, I'm trying this. Ordered the thing, had someone put it in for me. You had to take apart a door, and I'm not great at that, so I had someone put it in for me. And lo and behold, it fixed all the problems. 90 bucks, a little bit of labor to have someone put it in. Turns out that like every electronic thing in the entire car runs through this little plastic part inside the driver's door. And it fixed all the problems. The alarm stopped going off. You could lock the car amazing it stopped saying the trunk was open the vanity light and the visors worked I'm telling you it fixed everything I could drive it before like if even if it said the trunk was open it wasn't really open I could drive it in the end I was so glad that I didn't give up we could drive it but it was something so small and it turns out that once it got fixed man it was so much better afterwards and that's kind of how it is with church. It might take searching and trying and persevering. But when God brings you to the community that encourages you and you encourage it, I'll tell you what, you're going to find that it was worth the search. It might be something that makes all the difference in your walk with Christ, something tiny that happens within the house of God, someone to bounce your scripture reading off of. The chance to drop your kids off with someone else for an hour and take a breath. The fact that on your worst day, someone smiles at you and says, hey, I missed you last week. I'm praying for you. But the small stuff in life, that's what takes it from survivable to amazing. And Jesus doesn't want us to survive. It's got better for us than that. Of course, we hope this is the place for you if you're hearing this. The only thing we can't do whether it's here or somewhere else, is we can't give up. You can try, you can persevere, and you can look, but the thing you can't do is give up on meeting together. You can be a Christian without finding a church, but for the reasons I gave you, so many more, it's so much better if you find a church. You'll be so glad that you stuck it out. We do the routine maintenance of not giving up on church because it's commanded. Another big reason we do the routine maintenance of coming to church is this. There is wisdom that we have yet to find. Might just have blown your mind. There is stuff that you don't know yet. Stuff that I don't know yet. I just gave you the scripture that commands us to be part of church if we could find a way to do it. I understand there's just people who can't. 
And I gave you some practical reasons even. I had way more practical reasons that I could talk about why church is awesome all day and all night. But I want to address this idea that we see in all kinds of believers, kind of like an offshoot of what we just talked about. By all kinds of believers, I mean young and old, I mean new and seasoned, everything in between. There's the belief that there really isn't anything anyone else can teach us that we can't figure out on our own or that we don't already know. This is not related to age. I've met very humble 85-year-olds, very proud 20-year-olds, vice versa, everything in between. Don't want to share a scripture with you this morning. This is Ephesians chapter uh, 4, 14 through 16. I'm reading it to you the NLT today just because I love, uh, love the way it puts it. 4, 14 through 16, Ephesians chapter 4, it says this. This is Paul writing here. It says this. Then we will no longer be immature like children. We won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies. So clever they sound like the truth. Instead, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of the body, head of his body, the church. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly. As each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. Now, it's so true that there is great counsel, great wisdom available outside of these metaphorical four walls. Church building, it's not the only place you can find it. We don't have a corner on it at Engage Boise. I certainly don't have a corner on it. But the scripture, it speaks directly to one of the best things about going to church, and that is that God's design, the way he made it, is that we learn and grow with other believers. God's design is that you learn and you grow with other believers. That section of Ephesians we just read, it's preceded by a really well-known passage where Paul talks about the gifts that Christ gave the church. There's differing interpretations of those gifts, some of that for sure. There's the five-fold ministry and all those different ways of interpreting that. But the one thing that's really clear is that God's hope is that those gifts happen and are used within the church. And friends, I'll tell you this, if we're wanting to grow as disciples of Jesus, if we want to become disciples and make disciples, then we must be willing to learn from people who are gifted in areas that we are not. I'll tell you this, there may be even people who have similar gifts as, the, as you, but they're more seasoned or they're just plain better. That's what happens. You go to church and I run into people who are better at the stuff than I am that I like to do. It's just the way that it works. It's really not unlike any other area of our life. If you're hoping to grow in anything, if you're not willing to learn from someone, then growth will never happen. If you're not willing to learn, then growth will never happen. There's a big difference, though, hopefully, between the church and the world. In the world, especially in the workplace, you'll often run into people who they have all the knowledge, all the wisdom that you could ever need, but they are unwilling to share it with you. The reason they're unwilling to share is because they're more fearful they'll take you'll take their job or their influence than they are hopeful about the future and how you can help. But as the church, if we are moving in the right direction as the church, and not talking about our church, I'm talking about the big C church, all the churches. If we're moving in the right direction, then we are invested in growing together. And when we grow together, we can look uh, at what verse 14 tells us. If you have it pulled up, still look at it. Then we'll no longer be immature like children. We won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever they sound like the truth. We actually referenced that last week at the end. We read the scripture in Colossians. talked about how personal devotions, they keep us from being swayed by the opinions of the world. I'll tell you what, unpacking with other believers uh, what we learn it can help us walk even further down that path of not being deceived by the world. There's something that we all face as uh, people at some point, especially if we're following God, and that question we face is, what is God's purpose for my life? Everyone wants the answer to that. What's God's purpose for my life? And it can be hard to find. Sometimes there's a lot of wandering involved. Although sometimes the wandering is not all bad. It can be the whole point. Not all who wander are lost, Tolkien says, right, in the Fellowship of the Rings. Verse 15, it actually gives us really good direction on how we do this, how we find our purpose within the church. 
Instead, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. You see, instead of being blown back and forth by the winds and the opinions of the world, we have this ironclad process for becoming more like Jesus. And that is, we speak the truth in love, we grow in every way to be more and more like Christ. We speak the truth in love, others speak the truth in love, and we both grow and be more like Christ. While we manage to do those two things effectively, when we do it, we begin to find this amazing thing. We begin to find spiritual maturity. And when we mature in our faith, our purpose becomes more clear. When you mature in your faith, your purpose becomes more clear. Verse 16 is one we quote pretty often when it comes to using our gifts within the church. And that's the right interpretation of it. For sure. But we sometimes see that he makes the whole body fit together perfectly and uh, each part does its special work. We see those. But we forget about that little line in the middle and it says in the middle, it helps the other parts grow. This is the absolutely wonderful, beautiful, amazing thing about the local church, however imperfect it may be. It's that our gifts are designed to help others know Jesus better. God gave you the gifts he has given you so you can help people know Jesus better. And the gifts of others, they're designed to help you know Jesus better. There is stuff you will find at church that you will not find anywhere else. So to bring it back to the beginning of the point, for those of us, maybe you like me, have been around the block a few times when it comes to church. You've been to every kind, every size, every location. Or maybe those of you who haven't been, but in your short time being a part of church, you're like, you know what? I'm not so sure it's worth it. I've read what I've read. I've seen what I've seen. I watch the news, and I don't know. And there are times when you think, like I have in my life, I don't know if it's worth all the fuss. I know that you are out there. I know you are because I know people who have been in ministry, done the job that I'm doing, and now they don't even go to church because they've had enough. Maybe they don't even believe. A lot of people my age actually who got God and church intertwined and they could not separate the two. Now they don't believe in God at all. And I know people who believe in Jesus, but they say something like, church is not for me. It can't get any better than what I'm doing right now. So for the times when you think, I'm not sure it can get any better than just being on my own than just existing. I know that I have salvation and that's good enough for me. I'm going to heaven. Might not be great, but it works. Let's talk about cars one more time. My wife used to have this car before she was my wife. It was a 1990 Honda Civic. 1990, right, dear? Is that what it was? She doesn't know, of course. (laughs) I believe it was named Hans. You'll probably remember that part, right? It was, she remembers the name of the car. This was a 1990 Honda Civic. Uh, It was red. Some cars you see advertised, they have power everything. The 1990 Honda Civic, it had power nothing. (laughs) I'm not joking. It did not have power steering. Made in 1990, did not have power steering. I never saw the check engine light on this particular vehicle, but I'm not sure the lights on the dash worked, so it might have been on. You never really know. (laughs) She might have put tape over it. I'm not really sure. But I'll tell you what, it was a Honda, and what do you know about Hondas? They always start. Always started. It always started. It got her from Seattle to here when she moved. But that car, man, the windows leaked. The doors in the trunk wouldn't close. The speakers, if you dared to turn on the radio, if you could even see the little numbers enough, it sounded like you took a pair of headphones and just turned them up full blast. The headlights were like flashlights taped on the front. I mean, just endless lists of stuff. But man, that car always started. It was never a beauty. And really, uh, I think the thing that happened is she would tell you is she didn't know how to fix it. She didn't trust anyone to fix it without ripping her off. So she did what a lot of you would do and thought, it's fine. Just drive it. It was never a beauty. But little time and effort was able to uh, much more effectively accomplish its purpose. I'll never forget the time. We were not married yet. We lived in Nampa, we both did, and she was driving to work. And how many of you know, if you've been to Canyon County, the roads are not maybe as good as the roads in Ada County, not that ours are great, but 
you may have find the occasional bump in the road in Canyon County. And she called me and she's like, I have a flat tire. I was like, okay. She's like, I hit something in the road. I think it was a pothole. I have a flat tire. And I'd never heard of anyone hitting a pothole and getting a flat tire. But I was like, okay. I was like, well, yeah, hang on, just pull over. Can you limp it to a parking lot? I'll come, I'll come help you. I'll come change a tire. So I put through a few tools in the car. I don't know a lot about cars, but I do know how to change a tire. So I threw some stuff in whatever vehicle I had and went over there and she was like so grateful and also pretty amazed. This might be the time when I sealed the deal she would marry me because I could because I could change a tire in the parking lot. I don't really know. <laughs> she was impressed that I could change the tires and I put the spare on and we got her on the road. I think I took her to work and then went back and fixed it. I don't really remember, but I, anyway, I fixed it. But I got to look on these tires, man. I, like, I might be able to manufacture tires like that in my backyard. They were so cheap. And I said, hey, you know, we could get you some better tires. She's like, I don't know, it's way too much money. And I was like, it won't cost very much, a couple hundred dollars. So we got her some decent tires, and then we got her some studs. Turns out when she got studs on her car, she could pretty much go anywhere she wanted in the snow, in the Treasure Valley. I started to work on the trunk and the windows, and all it took was like a little weather stripping, you know, you like shove it up in the gap, and magically the rain doesn't come in anymore. The little time and effort, it was able to much more effectively accomplish its purpose. And its purpose was to take care of the person that was driving it. Yeah, it got her from point A to point B. As long as it wasn't raining, then you might drown. But I believe it's so clear. It's God's design that we do the routine maintenance of finding a church. We allow him to mature us. And as we do, we encourage one another in the building of our faith. We allow him to come along and fix up the weather stripping and find a little better tires, fix up the sway bar link. It might never be perfect. When it comes to cars, you pretty much can never get them perfect. The church might never be perfect, and I can guarantee you it won't be until Jesus comes back because there's no perfect people. But it does help us, the church does help us find God's purpose for our lives. And it helps others find the purpose in their lives as well. I'm the pastor of the church, so of course I'm gonna say this, but 90 minutes a week, church, or a small group every couple weeks, it might not sound like much. But the small stuff makes a big difference. It could change your life. And I promise you, there are things you will learn from other people if your heart's open to it. I promise. As we close today, I just want to leave you with a couple more thoughts. That's this. Our call as believers is to not give up on the mission that God has given the church. We actually left off that passage in Hebrews before touching on the final line. And that final line answers a question for us. And that is, why are we commanded to do this, to not give up on meeting together? And the reason is given in the last line of verse 25. If you still have it pulled up, you can look it up. That reason is because the day of Jesus' return draws nearer, nearer each and every day. That's why we don't give up. Because here's the translation. We don't know when Jesus is coming back, but there is a day that is set. We don't know when the day is. We don't know when each of us will draw our last breath. We don't know if it will happen before Jesus returns. All of that means that we don't have time to waste. It's too important to be messing around. Instead, let's get together and do something together that we never could have done alone. Set aside our differences, focus on what we have in common. Let's go do the thing that we're commanded to do, which is point people towards Jesus with all we have in us. And that's what we have to understand this morning, friends, as believers. Man, the mission is so important. And the mission is not so we can count a number and say, boy, we had X amount of people at the church. Aren't we great? The mission is because there's so many people who need to know about the grace and mercy of Jesus. So many people who don't know. The whole world, friends, is asking this question. What does life mean? Pastor Joey likes to talk about how he had a pastor who talks about the God-shaped hole. And there's people who are asking, what do I do with the God-shaped hole inside of my heart? Well, I'll tell you what, you have the answer. In the local church, we have the answer. 
The mission is so crystallized for us in the great commission we find, Matthew 28, 19, and 20. You know this verse, therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. So we do all of that, all of this, because we're obeying that command. We're doing our best to obey it. So this morning, friends, our hope is we fulfill the Great Commission as a church. Today we tell of the good news of Jesus. The good news is that, yes, uh, we're all sinners in need of a Savior. But God created us to be with him. God created me and you to be with him today. Our sin, it can't be remedied by good deeds, but there is hope. And the hope that we talk about and we sing about, John 3, 16 and 17, for this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. God sent his son into the world, not to judge the world, but to save the world through him. You see, Jesus, friends, he paid the price for our sin. All we must do is place our trust in him. Just bow your heads and close your eyes this morning. We're almost done. We often signify placing our trust in Jesus by praying, confessing that Jesus is Lord. I like to be sensitive to what the Lord is doing each week and handle this part of the service differently. Last week, we repeated a prayer. I'm not going to do that today, but as Pastor Joey just plays and God's Spirit moves in this place, I'm just going to give you a chance um, to speak with God today. If you're here today and you hear us talking, singing about Jesus in heaven, and you think, man, I, I want that. What we just read is true. God sent his only son, Jesus, and he died. He lived a life with no sin, and he died, and he rose again for me and you. And today, if you want to be assured of going to heaven to have salvation, forgiveness of your sins, all you must do is place your trust in him. A lot of times we signify that by praying a prayer out loud, confessing that Jesus is Lord, but you can do that in your own heart right now. Just whisper a prayer to Jesus. Say, Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Make me brand new. I accept you into my life. Would you become Lord and Savior of my life? I'm just going to encourage you. Uh, take a moment. Speak with Jesus today if you need to. need to know this morning that if in that moment, just to yourself, between you and God, you whispered a prayer. Jesus is making you new, forgiving your sins. As you've repented of your wrongdoings to the best of your ability, Jesus is making you new. Let's be close this morning, friends. We're going to pray. Be done just a moment. Let's pray as a church body that God would give us the strength to not give up. It's not that they're are not hard days because there are. What we must do is not give up. Let's pray that God would give us the strength to understand that there's more we can learn. There's always more we can learn. To be encouraged that God has a mission for our church. However imperfect our church and the Big C Church may be, God has a mission for us and we get to be a part of that mission by God's grace. Lord, thank you for your church the Big C Church, but especially thankful for this church, for Engage Boise, for this body of believers here today, watching online, here in the podcast, however they're hearing this. Lord Jesus, thank you for our church. Thank you that you have given us a place to meet right in the middle of the city of Boise. Thank you that there's people here today who have done what you've commanded. They have not given up on meeting together. But I pray you would do something amazing in their hearts and lives, Lord. I pray that you would draw them to the people they can encourage with their gifts and their faith. Would you help them to encourage us with their gifts and their faith? Lord Jesus, we place our hope and our trust in you. And as we talk about your love and your grace and your mercy, I pray we would never give up on telling people about your good news on the Great Commission. We would never give up on becoming disciples and making disciples. Lord, that all of that would be true and engage Boise. Lord, we love you. Thank you for this day, for your presence with us as we sang, your presence as we examined your word. I pray uh, you would let your grace and mercy find deep places within us, Lord, in your name. Amen. Amen.
Friends, if you are here today and you said that, you said a prayer between you and God, and you feel like uh, you want to start a new journey with Jesus today, I have a book I'd love to give you. It talks about our relationship with God. Love to pray with you and know all about it. Thanks for coming to church today. Hey, don't miss Wednesday night. We're going to set up a couple extra tables. We hope to see you there and uh, have a wonderful afternoon. Go take good care of your cars. Fix all your sway bar links.